The world wobbles as it spins. It wobbles terribly because it's inhabited by men and women who shake internally, whose daily lives are a series of frustrations and tensions and confusions. So what else would you expect for the whole world to shake and tremble when everyone on it is doing it just that. And if you'd like to know at the very start the cause of all stress, all anxiety, all nervousness, I will give it to you. And as I tell you what it is, will you look back at yourselves at the moment I tell you and try to see how true it is of your personal life, no matter what your life is today, whether it's financially successful or otherwise, or whether you have a nice, comfortable home or not. When I tell you the cause of all human tension and anxiety, try to connect it with your own life, with your own mind. You are in anxiety, you're in all sorts of irritation, and confusion about yourself because you live in self-doubt. Self-doubt. You don't know who you are. You don't know what you're doing here. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing with your life here on earth. But you say you do. What a tragedy. What a shame that you have continued into your inner conflict, continued with it so long without investigating fearlessly the cause of it, which is the fact that you don't know who you are at all and you're looking desperately around trying to find someone who will tell you or some event that will tell you. And oh, what a very, very curious condition. Because look, can you see how many identities, how many labels you have just here tonight? Let's name a few. You're an American. You're a businessman. You're a parent. You're a voter. You're a citizen. You're a resident of a certain state. Look, look, you have hundreds of ideas about yourself. You have dozens of ways to describe yourself and in spite of them and the changing and the additional ones, in spite of that, the nervousness and the pain and the strain remains. What a very curious situation then that we have, we make all these efforts to try to calm down the inner ache and it hasn't succeeded, has it? All we do is work hard, work desperately at the wrong thing, and go to bed, go to bed every single night, just as worried, just as helpless as we did the night before. The whole situation that I've talked about up until now can be investigated, it can be understood, it can be received and it can be changed. This means that you, whoever you are, man, woman, young person, older person, listening to what we're saying tonight, you can begin to enter a different kind of a world than the one you now occupy, which is not a happy world at all, and nobody knows it better than you. You're the one living in that world, and you're the one who's suffering from it. And I'm here tonight, today, to tell you that you can change. And here's where we're going to start. If being a carpenter or a successful man about town, or being a successful parent or whatever, if these labels do not do anything for us, then what will? We'll find out right now. Find out by 
by discovering that there are two kinds of cells. And the first one that I'm going to describe, you know all about it because it is your present life. One self which the vast majority of human beings live in, you can call it the outlaw self. Outlaw self. Now why do we call it that? Simply because human being living this kind of life is outside the spiritual laws that he could live under. He's outside the calm and the understanding and the poise that could be his if he would cease to be an outlaw. To be an outlaw simply means to be in these states we described earlier, one in which you don't know what you're doing. You don't know, you didn't know what to do today, but you did it because the automatic compulsive forces carried you through. Which, uh, listen to me, please. You didn't like most of the things you did today, did you? You didn't like the thoughts you thought. You didn't like the feelings that went through you. You didn't like the way you didn't, didn't ha handle that situation at all correctly. You didn't like the way you mishandled it. The outlaw self is simply an artificial personality in which most human beings live and which has no reality to it. It has no, how do you like this? It has no future to it at all because it's a time state. It's a state built up in time according to your conditioning, to what people told you you should be. Wouldn't you like to have a state? Isn't there, isn't there something in you that yearns for something that's going to last more than this present life? I will tell you that it exists, but it does not exist within the realm of the outlaw self. Aren't you tired enough yet? Aren't you tired of being like a outlaw in the Old West who gets on his horse after committing a crime and he rides out into the hills? I'm describing human beings. I'm describing your life and you know it. And he rides the horse out into the hills evading the sheriff's posse. And he feels, he feels temporarily safe when he finds a cave or a gully or a rock to hide behind. He can see the you can see the posse coming miles away. Don't you feel that you're living under a threat? Of course you do. This is no way to live at all. I'm trying to get a point over to you of supreme importance that the way you are now going through your life is no life at all and you know it. You try to kid your tension. You try to evade your nervousness. You try to run away from your hostility and you'll never succeed and you never have. You can start because there's a way out, because there's a, another way to handle life, and to under, which is to understand life. So here's our outlaw running. Am I describing your life now? <clears throat> running from gully to cave, from cave to rock, from rock to the back of a hill somewhere. Never never being able to rest at all because something because something is chasing him shall i tell you what it is now we'll switch back to our life shall i tell you what's chasing you your own nature the nature you have preferred you are living the exact kind of life you have asked for you are getting exactly what you want. Some life, some tragedy, something is going to have to come along and force you against your own egotistical will to see where you are so you can say, I don't want to be out in the hills anymore, running, 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 scared all the time. Wondering if I'm going to be able to last one more day out there. That outlaw is all alone, isn't he? He's isolated. He's apart from the world. He's not in harmony with the rest of the world. He's way out there in the edges of things. 
Well, isn't his loneliness and isolation very characteristic of your day? Of course it is. Are you beginning to understand then what we're, understand what we're getting at? that you're living a certain kind of a condition because you have chosen it, and maybe, maybe the reason you have selected that kind of a nervous, tense life is because no one has ever told you about something different. Tonight you were hearing about something different and you can start to change tonight. You can begin to see that there is no necessity and there is certainly no, no glory. And being out in those hills being chased all the time. Don't you feel chased? You know very well you do. Someone gives you a frown and you feel chased. Your money disappears a little faster than you think it should and you feel chased by economics. And you're never, never quite able to identify the enemy and I'll tell you why you're not. Because you're putting it outside of you instead of inside yourself. It's your own confusion that is the outlaw. It's your own refusal to see and understand this that keeps your life going the way it is. Now look, I know very well all the escapes you use out there in the hills so you duck behind them and you have a moment of what you call peace. Eh, hiding behind that rock, you're still scared. The posse's still coming. Here is one of the rocks that you hide behind. It's called having someone to be with, having someone to talk with. Who is it? spouse, friend, your television set. And you sit here right now listening to this talk and you don't understand how quickly you would collapse if one of your supports were taken away. Just as if the rock was to suddenly roll away in front of the outlaw and there, there was the sheriff and the posse out seeing him as the rock rolled away. Every time you break down, which you do all the time, every day, many times a day, every time you break down, you get anxious, you get nervous, you get irritable, you get hateful, which you do, and hide it. That's why you keep it. Every time you break down, it's because the rock has rolled away temporarily and you're exposed to yourself and that makes you nervous. And then you quickly run to the next rock, the next boulder, and hide behind it. Have you ever heard of such a thing as living from your own nature, from your own real nature, from your essence? Ah, now, now we are talking about the lawful self. The lawful self. You can start to acquire it. If you love truth more than you love your wife, more than you love your husband, more than you love your money, more than you love your phony reputation, you can begin to, you can begin to have a lawful life in which you'll be out of the desert forever and not running anymore. It comes as a start through information such as you're hearing tonight, through application of the knowledge, comes through a very, very firm self-honesty about your condition. It, com it comes when you start to love something different than what you now love. What you now love is your own mechanical nature, which, by the way, you also hate. What a situation. You both like it and dislike it, and you're caught in it. This new nature that we're talking about does not come through any human being at all, does not come through any human organization. No group can give it to you. Even your own mind, as it presently works, can't give it to you. It comes to, it comes to an outlaw, male or female, who has been out in those hills dodging and cringing so long and so wearily that he begins to wonder if there might be a way out of the whole problem and he begins to investigate it. See, all our life, because we, didn't in, we did indeed know no better, we looked around the world at another human being, a 
what you ladies would call a handsome man or a pretty girl or any kind of a man or a woman. Or you looked through a certain activity or a certain financial venture or a certain set of daydreams and you look to those to give you peace from being an outlaw and it won't work. What you have to do is to cease to be an outlaw altogether so that you begin to have a new nature which is one with itself and which is getting its guidance and its inspiration, real inspiration from something higher than this world. Come on, come on now. Don't you suspect, and it's a right suspicion, that this world has nothing right to give you? Suspicion? It ought to be a thundering conviction with you because it never has given you anything worthwhile, anything lasting. I told you, you say that home you have, that business you have, those friends you have, you say that they keep you from being scared, then how come you're still scared having them? You say, you say they keep the posse at bay at a distance. How come you tremble and have to hide behind the rocks, which is this hiding behind your own justifications, behind your own delusions? Picture a, a lake, pretty lake, way up in, high up in the mountains, pure water. And the lake begins to flow down in a form of a stream and it winds its way on down to the desert. And down in the desert there are human beings, such as the kind we've talked about. In this life, let me tell you something startling, and something that you should start right tonight to see thoroughly. Here's this water that could take away the thirst of those human beings down in the desert and it flows all the way down. And maybe one man, one woman, out of all those people living down in the dry desert, only one or two come over and drink the water. And having tasted it, having tasted it, they want to find the source, and so they start climbing the mountain. Most human beings are not going to even find the water because they say they already have it. How, how astonishing that a man or a woman can say that they have a spiritual life even, or can say that they're content, and all the time they're saying it, you're reading their faces and it tells the exact opposite story. So we have the two selves. Most people live with the outlaw self, continue to live with it. You can be different if you want. You can start to change if you want. And when you do, all this anxiety and stress tension that we talked about will begin to fade because the outlaw nature fades so does everything connected with it and a lot lot more your daily worry about the future for example and best of all or one of the best of all is a change in your need to protect yourself to be defensive have you noticed how touchy you are people come around and touch you in the wrong place and you you jump and you have, to, you have to always be on guard. Wouldn't it be nice to, to be able to just sit back and relax and let the world come to you, let the world circle around you, let, let the world do anything it wants and it can't touch you because you are no longer down in that dry, dusty desert. Having, having come to a place like this, having heard these truths, you, you begin to get excited in a new way about them. You begin to see that that first taste of the water that came down from high, that first taste of the water, this, this is what begins to take away the thirst. This is what works. Before you were taking sand and calling it water, and then you couldn't understand why your thirst continued is because you took sand as water. See, when you take real water, even in an ordinary situation on a hot day, and you drink water, your thirst goes away, doesn't it? Because the water is real. A really, truly spiritual life, if you have the water of life, you begin to drink it, and you get the taste for it, and you begin to love it more than you love your self-deception of calling sand water. 
If you love the truth more than anything else, you'll be, you'll be led to where that stream comes down. I don't care if you're a million miles away. I don't care how many bad, evil things. I don't care how hard you are. If you want the water of truth, you can have it because it itself will draw. You will sense the direction of it and you'll walk toward it. And you'll drink it, and once you drink it, you'll want to go higher and higher and find the original source, which is saying union with truth, union with reality. Let me give you some more thoughts on dealing with stress, tension, tightness. Think about this very seriously, please, what I'm going to say next. Would you agree that this is a wrong world? This world of everyone fighting individually and internationally, inwardly, in the home. What is the home like? What is your home like? Will you agree that it's a world of wrongness in a thousand different ways? Now listen to what I'm going to tell you. Effective as of right now, I want you to think of the world's wrongness and your own wrongness, I want you to think of the wrongness that you live in as an intimidation. You know what it means to be intimidated? Have you ever been intimidated? Of course you have. Have you ever intimidated someone else? Put pressure on them. I want you to know that the wrongness of this on this earth is nothing but an intimidation which you don't see through as yet. You don't understand that it's not necessary at all for you to shake in front of it. You don't understand, you don't understand that there's no power whatever in people who are evil in any way at all. Well, we'd better find out why you do shake in front of people. Very simple if you want to see it, it's because you have the very same thing in yourself. If you are ever intimidated, intimidated by other people, it's because you still have the wish in yourself to intimidate other people, and that is a level. And that is a very destructive level. Start with that much. Begin to see that it's not necessary to be, I said it's not necessary to be scared of anyone or of anything, of anything about your life, whatever. You want to take that as a challenge? You can prove for yourself that it is absolutely true. Here, here are human beings like a man, he fell down and hit his head and he's sitting by the roadside in a daze and people are passing by him and he asks a passerby, this, listen, he asks a passerby this pathetic question. He asks a man who comes along, he says, do you know who I am? A woman comes along and the man with a dazed head has lost his identification, has lost his wallet. He says to a woman who comes along, do you know who I am? He asks the next two or three people, do you know who I am? I don't know who I am, can you tell me? And I want to tell you one of, the, one of the worst tragedies of this life that you live in. Every one of those people that he asks will tell him who he is, and every one of them will deceive him. They will, they will tell him about his outlaw self and encourage him in that. All of society, all of society is against society. All of society is against the individual because all of them are a state, in a state of sleep and that's the only advice they can give. Do you, wanna, do you wanna start a truly spiritual life in which your mind is perfectly clear as to your identity? So you'll know exactly who you are every second of the day next week and next month and for the next five years, you'll know exactly who you are and what you will know, what you will know finally and forever that you really were not an outlaw after all. You thought you were. You thought that that was the exciting life and the necessary life. No one ever told you different. You've been told different now. In the last few minutes, you've been told something entirely different. That you 
Do you know what you've been told? You have been told that you don't have to suffer anymore if you don't want to. Now let's try that one again. You've been told that you don't have to shake in front of the world of finances as you presently do. You don't have to tremble before other human beings like you used to. You've been told that you can be a free human being. Tonight you've been given a taste of the water that comes from a higher place. Taste it and you'll want to spend the rest of your life climbing the mountain to its pure source. Then all will be different. So I invite you now, right now, to use the R&R &R method, which is relax and receive. You can just, you can do it deliberately, consciously right now, and I ask you to do this. Relax the physical body first. Remember, if you give instructions to one center, the other tends to follow along because it doesn't want to be in contrary. There's something about your inner system when it begins to work right that wants to be rightly unified with the other parts so that when you physically relax and look around casually, knowing that you're looking around casually, the physical body invites the emotions and the thoughts to go along with the relaxation and that leads to receptivity. Then, instead of being on the battlefield, getting hurt and wondering when you're going to get it next, you're always wondering when you're going to get it next, aren't you? And that's why you get it next, because you're wondering when you're going to get it next, because there's an eye there that is protecting itself. The protection creates the enemy. So instead of being on the battlefield, will you all look at me and sit about the window, please? Were you aware that you did that? About 10 of you looked out the window. What's out there? Look here, not out the window. So rest and relax and receive, and you'll be on the mountain above the battlefield. You're not a participant anymore. You're not a soldier anymore. You're a civilian released from the rigors of army life, looking down, looking down and seeing where you used to be. And you can look at that spot over there to the left where you got wounded one time. And you can look at another spot over there where you get scared that the enemy artillery was going to open up on you. And you can look down and see those positions where you were in danger, but the moment of looking down from the mountaintop, down on the battlefield, you will no longer be in danger because you know where you are now. You know you're not down there taking one part, the green army against the blue army. You don't have any army identification at all. You're out of the army, therefore out of the battle, therefore free from the conflict and free from the wounds. You're being wounded because it's your great pleasure to get hurt and then, then uh, allow yourself to be taken to the hospital, the psychological hospital, for a few hours or a few days so you can sit back, so you can sit back and avoid your responsibilities, your responsibility to, to grow up, to become first a mentally mature human being, one who can earn his own living, who can think clearly and make decisions, and then go beyond that. Mental maturity is a foundation upon which you build a spiritual life, and then you never forget that. And I know you do forget it. You think you can continue to be as giddy, as foolish as you now are and grow. You can't. You have to start understanding what it means to be logical in the ordinary meaning of logic. Now you're not logical. You can't even shop wisely. You are self-defeating and spending your money. For, and that's an elementary thing. As the mind begins to clear, the light spreads into every corner of your life, including your finances, including how to talk with people, including places and people to avoid. The whole thing becomes clear. So, as a first point, understand that as long as your mind is running madly around, swirling like a a tornado, as long as that is your state, you have to begin to understand that state and understand why it is continuing that way. 
And the reason it is continuing that way, outside of the fact that you still love that, that's what you're in love with, is because it preserves your egotistical life, which you now love before truth. If, do you see the connection? If you're a tornado in your feelings and in your mind, that, that is your first love. You always have your first love. Your first love is you. Your first love is your imaginary you. Can you begin to give up then your love for what you call yourself, which is not yourself at all? Can you see that no one, nobody gives you trouble but yourself? No, you can't. Because still being intellectually bound, you divide into opposites and you say that person, that circumstance, that past, that experience is responsible for me being the way I am today and that is deliberate self-deception based in your love for egotism and con conceit. I'll tell you, if you want real magic, I'll tell you about it right now. When you start, as best you can, we have to start where we can, when you start to see that you are 100, not 99, not 98, when you are 100% responsible for what happens to you, all those bad events and all that misery inside, when you accept as a fact the fact that you are responsible for it, pure magic begins, be, begins to change you because you have now taken the fact as something to work with. And you will see, you will see if you say that I am responsible for the way I think, therefore I'm responsible for the results of the way I think, I cannot explain it to you, but I am telling you that if you see the cause of your inner condition, the tornado like that, if you see the cause of that, the seeing of the cause is the invitation to the cure. Now, I leave it to you to do it. I leave it to you for right spiritual action. And we'll amplify it and also expand it a little bit. There is a spiritual teacher who's known as a great teacher who understood life and himself and the world. And it was announced that this great spiritual teacher was going to come to a big city and give a big lecture, a series of five lectures. So sure enough, he came into town, a big auditorium was hired. And the first night of the five lectures, there were 10,000 people in the hall. All enthusiastic, but mostly curious. An enthusiasm that had more curiosity in it than sincerity. Does right? it sound familiar? 10,000 people in the hall. So they all came and he gave a lecture, gave a good talk about spiritual principles, told them what was wrong with them, told them the cure, which is something higher than themselves. Gave a good talk. Afterward, had an open discussion and question and answer period. And one man stood up in the audience and he said, Sir, is there some kind of a special device, method, technique, secret that you have used that maybe you could tell us about so we in turn could use it to grow faster than we have. And the teacher said, yes, indeed, there are. I, like you, developed in a certain way. Certain things were more important to me at a certain time, just as certain things are more important to you. And I will certainly tell you what this secret is, this secret for inner, rapid inner growth. However, I will tell you about it at the last of the five meetings the last few minutes of the last of the five meetings. And he said consciously, knowing what he was doing, what he was saying, he said, how many of you 10,000 people will be here to hear this great secret? 10,000 people raised their hand. Second meeting, it was down to 5,000. Next meeting, down to 2,000. Finally, at the last meeting, there were only 100 people in that huge auditorium, which is exactly the way it always was wherever he went and gave talk. So 
on the last meeting, someone said, sir, he knew what he was going to say anyway, but people don't know that. He said, sir, uh, said, sir, what is this secret that you're now going to give us? And he said, now listen carefully, because you always take words uh, without understanding. You take the word and you get a certain surface thrill over hearing the words. But I want you to take these words and just explore it endlessly, just like you go into a, a, a new cave and see all the treasures that have been hidden there over the centuries. Here's the secret. Here's the secret, ladies and gentlemen, that I used, and I want you to start using too. Start where you are, and you'll, you'll see the, the vastness of it. And it, it's far beyond what you can know now. Here it is. And the teacher said, for a long, long time, for many years, and I still do, I, I said to the world, I said to the world, don't tell me what I want. Don't tell me what I want. All right. I'm talking to you now. Let's just suspend the teacher up there on the platform for a minute before the hundred people left. Advertising tells you what you want. Your, your conniving friends and relatives tell you what you want. Don't you want to marry me? Don't you want to loan me money? Don't you want to be my friend? Don't you want to go on a trip with me? On and on. Are, now look, are, are you thinking now? Are you with me? I'm talking to you now. Do you know that practically every word that someone says to you is telling you what you want? It's so subtle, so smooth, so cunning to lead you. Look, a person, always a lost person, and everybody, practically everyone's lost, a lost person always speaks to you from himself, does he not? From his conceited self, his self-glorified self. Therefore, he is telling you what you want for his benefit. Now, you study, when you go out of here, that single phrase, don't tell me what I want. You'll have to be conscious of the fact that you are indeed trading with other people. And you, look, boy, you, you have to talk about uh, the sharpness of a hawk's eyes. You have to be have a spiritual sharpness inside of you that never misses when you read that ad, when you see TV, and and you're identifying yourself <coughs> as the hero or the heroine in that story. Take that take that phrase. Don't tell me what I want. Put it on a piece of paper somewhere and carry it around with you for a long time and look at it often so that you can see what you can't see now that everyone is doing this to you. They're telling you what you want and why for their benefit, not yours. Now, if you carry this far enough, you will begin to detach yourself from the evil mag magnetism, magnets of other people. You begin to detach yourself so you're no longer drawn to their cunning invitations. And when that happens, you, your energy that we spoke about recently, your energy can now be directed toward becoming conscious of what you really want. But what you really want can never be told you by you. What you really want has to be told you by something that is not you. Do you understand that? No, you don't. Because you just think. You thought <coughs> about what I said and you thought about it from your own self from your own desires, from your own name. Remember, you can never honestly and accurately tell yourself what you really want in life. Only God can do that. But you have to see that the whole world outside and your mixed up world inside have been telling you what you want. You want to get married. You want to get rich. You want to get famous. And you even want security. But when the self asks for security, it wrecks security because it's apart from reality. <clears throat> so you will see, finally, the whole world is telling you what you want for their benefit. You want to vote for me, don't you? On and on and on. You want to buy this 
product, don't you? On and on and on. Again, you could take a piece of paper and make a long list of where people are telling you what you want, and I want you to know that you don't want it at all. Now, what you really want, which you cannot tell yourself about, but which will come to you as a real revelation, what you want is to get off the battlefield. See, now you don't know the top of the mountain yet, so you, you can't really say, I want to be on top of the mountain, because you know nothing about it. Hypocritical religious people, quote Mark, know all about the mountain, which they have built up in their imagination, their future heaven, and, and so on. They, if, look, look, isn't that strange? They believe in the future heaven, and they live in hell here. That means they're living in time, does it not? Ponder long and deep the fact that everyone, including yourself, you're telling yourself the same thing, what you want. And have you noticed? Have you noticed that you're still thirsty? Therefore, therefore you're not getting the water of life. As you, as you say, look, you'd better get fierce. You'd better get firm. Don't tell me what I want. I'll add something to that. Leave me alone. Close your door and lock it. And when they knock, don't answer. Oh, you poor pathetic people. You go to the door thinking that when you open it, they're going to have goodies for you. Oh, someone's knocking on my door. Maybe they're going to give me something, bring me something, something that I need. And your little foolish hearts walk to the door and open it. And there's a, a, a thug. There's a bum standing there. A bum, a bum wearing a suit and tie and a smile. Or a pretty dress and a smile. And they're going to tell you, they're going to tell you what you want. See, if you could be aware of your suggestibility and of your desperation, your desperation to find something that did fill up the aching void inside, if you could just become aware of that and bear it, stay inside the house and bear it, don't answer the door, write that down, don't answer the door. Back to our teacher. He went to a second city. Same thing happened. 10,000 people the first night. Someone asked him for another secret. He said, fine, I'll tell you a secret at the end of the last meeting, end of the five meetings. How many of you will be here? All 10,000 raised hand. Fifth meeting came. Someone asked him, what's the secret? And he finally told him what it was. And I, I now tell it to you. The second secret he gave was, take me or leave me. Listen to that. Take me or leave me. Because, sir or madam, I am on the path of truth. I have caught a glimpse of the real light off in the distance. Just a glimpse, but I know it's there. And I know I'm going to stumble over the rocks and fall into the gullies a thousand times. I know that, but I'll tell you something else. You take me as I am, that is, as a person who's beginning to find reality. You take me as that or leave me. I will not settle for more or less than that. That's exactly what you have to do. You take me as I am, that is, as a person who's beginning to find reality. You take me as that or leave me. I will not settle for more or less than that. That's exactly what you have to do. You're going to lose a lot of friends and you can applaud wildly over that. Take me, see, take me or leave me. See, you can't do that, can you? Because when you come to the leave me part, you start to tremble. No human being is worth two cents in their present corrupt state. Look, you've got it backwards, I told you. 
Last night I told you you've got everything backward. For them to leave you is what is good for you, not bad. Oh, what if I lose my spouse? If I lose my friend, I lose my reputation, I lose my club, I lose my activities, I lose my circle of going here and going there. But if I lose that, I'll be scared. I'll feel a sense of loss. You're already living in 100% loss. I'll tell you what this adds up to. It adds up to you starting to understand and getting so fierce about it. I don't care who you are out of this four other billion people here on earth. I don't, I don't care who you are. I am not going to compromise anymore. I understand, at least in a beginning way, that you have nothing to give me but your sickness. And believe me, I've got enough of my own without getting it from you. But at least I know that. I understand that. I understand the reason that I've been getting sicker all these years is because I've been taking it from both you and me. Ah, I have cut, I have cut you out of my life altogether. Take me or, or leave me, and you stay with that. And this will force you to be honest, because before, in your interchange with other people, you've been able to blame them, get mad at them, charge them with your misery. See? Now you've cut them off. What are you faced with? You're faced with this 100% responsibility for your own inner condition. This is a very rough jolt when you come to this stage. No more relieving no more feeling good and getting the exciting thrill out of hating someone for causing you that trouble. Oh, oh boy, I'll tell you. When you see what that consists of, when you see what revenge consists, when you see what revenge consists of, it is impossible for you to go into it anymore in a small or large way. Because you see the connection, the connection between self-destruction and revenge. You see that self-destruction and revenge are the same thing. You find it in your mind. I know you don't go out and throw rocks at people in revenge. Not physical rocks. But I want you to know how you do it inwardly and how you get a great thrill out of striking out. It's a, don't you know what you're doing? Can't you see that you are living in hell? Whew. To an insane mind, hell is heaven. You see why? To an insane mind, the hell of hatred and revenge is heaven. Why? Because it maintains the self. It maintains the self-glorified self. I hate you. If you want eternal life, which you can have, and which you don't understand, if you want that, take this point also as a study, a special study for weeks and months and years that, that, you, can, that you can have eternity or you can have time hatred. Cut yourself off from everyone, mentally, psychologically, not physically all the time. Cut yourself off completely and you tell yourself, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to be caught in your traps and your lures. You have nothing to give me. Now look, take me or leave me means this. You are a student of reality. You're tired of being sick. So, you will never again enter into a discussion about truth with a person whom you know is sick and lost. You say in detail, beyond your take me or leave me, you say to that person or then, I'm not going to discuss these matters with you. 
Because I know that you're a con man, a con woman. The only reason you want to discuss them is to get an ego thrill yourself. And I know exactly what you're going to say. I even know the exact phrases you're going to use. And we've written them down on the brain donkey list, haven't we? You've seen that list. And a, a lot more besides. They want to come up and talk with you about the truth as if they know what it is. As if a brain donkey can understand astronomy. In their ignorance and in their stupidity and in their arrogance, they will come up as if they're capable of an intelligent discussion about truth. Now let's hear, uh, let's go out into the farmland and, and walk up to a donkey and hear him discuss astronomy intelligently. But human beings are capable of a voice, they're capable of mechanical energy, and they're capable <coughs> of supreme egotism in which they, in their sickness, think that they're contributing. They actually think they can teach you something about truth. It happens in this room all the time. It happened about a week ago here with a woman. And by the way, I told that woman in different words. The meaning was the same. Take me or leave me. Do you know what she did? She left me, which I knew, of course, would happen. You put it that way, and and you'll begin to put yourself in a little bit of a, of a new challenge, a new circumstance, where you're not going to coddle yourself anymore. Oh, no, sir, you ladies say that to men, and you men say that to ladies. You say it to the whole world. Take me or leave me. I am, I'm on the path. And all the old tricks that I used to fall for, no more. I'm not going to fall for it anymore. Back to our teacher who went on to Third City. 10,000 people the first night. Someone asked for a secret. He said, I'll tell it to you at the end of the fifth meeting. At the fifth meeting, there were 100 people left. And the secret this time was, talking to the world, he says, this is the secret I use and I want you to use. And this connects with the previous point. The third secret was, all I have to say to you is goodbye. You understand? All I have to say to you is goodbye. Don't talk to me. I don't even want to associate with you physically. Because I know what you are. And I'll tell you what you are. You're a drainer of life. And you're trying to draw me into your net. Oh, no. I'm even going to stay away from you physically. I'm not going to have anything to do with you whatever because I understand. I understand how I used to be and believe me, ladies and gentlemen, I understand what you are like and no more. I ha look, look. I have had it, right? You understand? I've had it. You may have to say that mechanically for a long, long time before, before, the meaning, before the meaning is supplied to you by the higher energy which you have made room for. Oh, I'll tell you, you can walk the, the streets of the city, you can be out at work, you can be anywhere at all, and the whole world becomes so clear to you. You, you'll see the whole world, your relatives, everyone in an entirely different way because you have un first understood your own world in an entirely different way. You begin to separate and stand apart and look back at it simply as the observer, the man on the mountain looking down at the battlefield where the two armies are clashing. Can you this morning, can you this morning begin, begin to stop loving your wounds. A wound is anything that vibrates you, and anything that gives you false excitement, that gives you a false sense of self, false feeling of life. A wound is anything that gives you a negative vibration, but you have to stop calling it a positive vibration. 
Every once in a while, we'll get a, a hate letter in the mail. Not too often. And you can just look at that letter, and you can see everything about the person who wrote it. First of all, you, you know that this person is very sick. And second, you know that he or she is still trapped by what we're talking about. That is, their life, their life is lifelessness. And they have mistaken thrillism for being. Take that one again. They mistake thrillism for being. And, they, and it's a desperate, dangerous, miserable state because there is no being in, in sickness, in being violent. So you, you get onto this by observing yourself the next time you get an emotional, mental, or even physical thrill over anything at all. Anything. Never mind what it was. I want you to notice it, and then I want you to see that the thrill in it, in it was the thrill of feeling like someone. You ought to see the, some of the letters, and you can, you can analyze it. You can take a piece of paper and write a hundred points about these people who write them. They feel separate from the rest of the world with their false individuality. Now, if they feel separate, what is that? Oh, oh, that's the hell of isolation. That's the misery of loneliness. All sick people are super lonely. All super sickies are super lonely because of their isolation, because their thought self is apart from the whole reality. Do you understand that? They think, when you think I, you've already isolated yourself and therefore you're in great agony. All hell, to put another definition of it, is apartness from who you really are. The first part of this talk can be called the path to self-sickness. And here we go. There was once a human being, a male human being, who, like millions of other human beings, had a great ambition that haunted him, that overpowered him, that possessed him. And his great ambition was to become a famous painter, you know, famous artist. So he started off with making a few paintings, and he studied all the great artists of the past, Rembrandt, Van Gogh, Gainsborough. <clears throat> studied their technique and style and proportions, the whole business of artistry. And he was all excited about becoming famous and wealthy over becoming a famous painter, like one of the old famous classic painters. So. He shut himself up, according to tradition anyway, up in his little attic garret, garret up in the fourth story of some house somewhere, and started painting. And after getting a few paintings, he took them down to the art gallery and at open air exhibits. And for a while, he didn't expect anything to happen because he was a learner, a beginner, and nothing did happen. But as he began to paint more and more and more, he became disturbed because nothing continued to happen. No one wanted his paintings. No one even wanted to exhibit them. But he said, well, this is the way it is. It's rough at the start in a career. I'll keep after it. So he kept after it. And the longer he kept after it, the more frustrated and the beginning of anger and hostility came to him, entered into him. But he said, I'll persist. So he kept persisting, and he read books about success, how you should keep going under all circumstances. So he kept going. No one wanted his paintings, and they criticized them very harshly. So his bitterness grew and grew and grew until he said to himself, in great anger, as people always do, a great anger at the world, see? Anger being his substitute for understanding, as it is with most people. So he lashed out at a world that didn't appreciate his great artistry, which he considered marvelous. 
And after a while, another thing happened to him. I'm talking about human beings. I'm talking about you now. Follow along. He began to see a certain change inside himself. And what this change was, he began to, began to be very, very critical and harsh toward other artists and toward their paintings. And he'd make little comments when he'd go to an exhibit how badly proportioned that was or how the coloring wasn't right on this painting. And he got a, a strange sort of a thrill over being critical, accusing, uh, torpedoing other artists' paintings. And he began to write little articles in the paper, and they appeared in there, and he began to, began to build up his reputation as a critic. And they would appear in the paper, and he'd rush down and buy the paper, and he'd read about his criticism of the others. And he began to, you understand, he began to feel good because he was able to criticize someone else. And it grew and grew and grew until he became a well-known critic in the area he lived in. Carried his, the newspapers carried his articles all the time on the art pages. And he felt that at last he was a someone that he deserved to be. Not as an artist now. He failed as an artist, but as a critic. And a critic, he said to his mind, can even be greater than an artist. I can put those other painters into fear just with one sentence in the newspaper. And he began to feel very important. And he, and he learned to smile a lot because he felt something inside himself that was smiling, of course, which was not a real smile from his own real nature, but something quite different, and you understand that. One day he heard of a special new exhibit that was opening down at an art gallery, and the notice on it said that the famous new, not a famous painting, but a new painting was going to be exhibited, a painting that had recently been discovered and was going to be put on display down there. So he got his poison pen words ready in his mind, went on down there, went in the entrance, and he started criticizing the first paintings near the entrance. He was going to work his way on back to this special painting, whatever it was. So he looked to the right and he saw something and he made a note of the artist's name and of the painting itself, made a few sarcastic remarks about it, went over to the next painting, a few more sneering remarks about the ineptness of the artist, went on down. Finally he got to the end of the hall, where in a special place was this new painting that had been acquired. And he was just casually walking along, looking down, not knowing where he was, as most people walk. And all of a sudden he looked up, and there in front of him was this new painting that he had seen for the first time. <coughs> and he looked at it, and he stared, and he came to an inward stop as he looked at it, because he didn't understand it. This was something different than he'd ever seen before. And he stared and stared and stared at it. And then a, a second phase in his inner condition came. And that second phase was he began to develop a hatred for what he saw. And then the next phase was he tried to criticize. He tried to criticize the painting, but it, it disturbed him because he couldn't. He couldn't find anything wrong with the color, proportions, the general workmanship, craftsmanship of the painting. And the, and the harder he tried to find something wrong, the less he succeeded and the more angry and frustrated and fierce he began, became. It so disturbed him that he turned around and went home, and he sat in his little studio there for hours, wondering what had happened to him, what experience this was, and he didn't understand it at all. But he did understand one thing quite clearly. What he understood, that he despised that painting like he despised nothing else on earth. So he sat down and he got a dictionary, and he got all the, the villainous, evil, slanderous words he could think of, and he began to write an article against this painting, calling it the worst hoax of the ages. Paint put up in an art gallery and it was nothing but trash masquerading as a great painting. And then another strange thing happened, which he didn't understand. He was compelled to go back to that art studio and look at it again. He compelled to hate it all over again. 
He was tied to it. He couldn't let loose of it. Every day, for several weeks, he went down with his pencil, poison pen pencil, and wrote slanderous remarks about the painting. And as he did so, the owner of the art gallery began to notice something about him, <clears throat> began to notice that he was beginning to behave erratically as he stood in front of that painting. He start to shake, and his eyes would glare hatefully at it, and he would stay fixed. I'm talking about human beings. His eyes would be remain fixed at that painting. And he'd be rigid, then he'd relax, and then he'd suddenly laugh insanely. So the owner of the exhibit told his assistants, keep an eye on that man, that great critic out there. Something wrong with him. We better watch him. The day came when he stood in front of that painting and behaved so insanely, almost ready to attack it, to just try to destroy it, that the owner of the gallery called the police, and they came in, and they confronted him, and there he was standing there shaking. And they led him away, and they led him away to the insane asylum. What he didn't know was that this special painting was indeed a great masterpiece, one of the great classic paintings of one of the great painters of the past that had been recently been discovered. And they'd put it, put it there <coughs> just as sort of an experiment exhibit, just to see what would happen when people saw a great painting for the first time as compared to the lesser artworks in the gallery. So our painter, our critic rather, our critic looked at the painting and couldn't take it. He couldn't, he, he couldn't find anything wrong with it, and so he tried. Now look, so look you know, th this is so simple. You either appreciate truth or you attack it. You understand the parallel. I don't have to explain what I'm talking about, do I? Do I? You either appreciate the truth, a, a true artist, or you attack it. Now here's something very strange about a true spiritual artist, you know. Why does practically everyone on earth, people all surrounding this meeting room, why are hundreds, thousands, millions, billions of people surrounding this meeting room here, why do they attack truth? Now look, resistance to truth is attack on truth. Never forget it. Resistance is attack. Very simple. Why? I'll tell you why. You might want to write this one down. Truth sees things clearly. Why do people attack truth? Because it, it sees everything so with such clarity and clearness. <coughs> clearness is the enemy of a foggy mind that wants things to stay as they are, that wants itself to stay as it is, because as long as you're in a fog, you don't have to do anything but remain in it. You can drift downhill. Drifting downhill in the fog, you don't have to make any effort at all. You can just be what you are with all your hatred and all your criticism and all your violence. In short, you can continue. You can continue to drive yourself insane. And you know, I've asked you a number of times, what is the state of your mind? And some of you have described it up front here. Well, what would you call it? How would you describe the way your mind operates? Far from calling it an efficient, clear, workable mind that can take any situation, any situation, whether on the level of society or a higher level of the inner kingdom, does, is your mind able to take any situation and handle it, or does it block? Some where, to your degree, <coughs> each of you, <coughs> you are standing before truth and trying to find things wrong with it, and that will guarantee your eventual residence in the nut house. Well, excuse me, you're already there. Now I'll tell you how to get out of it. This is the next part, which you can call the path to self-healing. Here's another story. 
There was a great spiritual teacher who used his own special methods for conveying the truth to people. So one day, he brought in a big cardboard box, big as a television set, bigger than a television set. And he put it on the table right in the middle of the classroom where every student would be walking by it several times a day. And he wrote the word computer on the big cardboard box. And he said, now, ladies and gentlemen of this class, I'm going to teach you a very special lesson, and you're going to remember this because you're going to participate in it. As you see, students, I've written the word computer on this big cardboard box. So I just want you to imagine for the time of this uh, lesson, I want you to imagine this is a computer. You know what a computer is. Uh, lights and we lights flashing, wheels going around, sounds and clickings coming out of it. I just want you to imagine that this is a computer on this table here. That's the lesson for now, and we'll see what happens later. So for several days, the students came in and out, and they went up and down, past the big box there, labeled computer, listened to the lessons from the teacher, went out of the classroom, passed the box again. So he asked them finally, after 10 or 12 days, is there anyone here who might wonder, who might wonder if they know what the lesson is of that box being placed there? computer being placed there. And they guessed various reasons for it, but none of them got it. Teacher said, all right. Now the lesson you're going to get is one you'll never forget because indeed you did participate in it. You were part of it. What did you do with that computer while it was there? And they glass looked blank a little bit. And he said, well, let me tell you what you did. Oh, what a lesson, he said. And oh, what a lesson I say to you. You know what you did with that computer with its wheels and flashing lights and clicking sounds? Do you know what you did with it? You passed by it. Some of you, 50, 60, 70 times, you walked past that box, past that computer, came back and passed by it again. Get the lesson, he said to his students. Get the lesson, Vernon said to the students. See what's happening. You don't bypass your mind. Uh, how many have clicking sounds in your mind? Yeah. How many have flashing lights? <laughs> how many have noisy wheels revolving? <laughs> Let's see the hands. Everybody, everybody raise your hand. We got you now. You think that it is essential to engage the computer to solve problems. But it can't solve them because the computer is a machine that can't think outside of what you put into it. Your mind can only consist of what you've added to it through your experiences, your own thoughts, and your own desires. <coughs> it is, now listen carefully, it is foolish, it is folly, it is useless, it is pointless. You are wasting your life. If you continue to try to consult the computer mind to solve your problems, you can, you can use it to learn how to cook or drive your car. You know that, because that's, that's where memory serves. That's all right. That part of the computer is useful for social needs. You try to, com to consult it for saying a matter of loneliness. I am lonely. What should I do about it? And the computer answers. Take a drink. Go to a party, lose yourself in wild imaginations or whatever. Lose yourself in vain and foolish and and weary weary firing, firing if there is such a word, yearning for things to be different. What how can you make things different just by yearning for it? That kind of yearning, I mean. You have learned wrongly in the past to go up to the computer and ask it questions, gone up to your own mind. And you always get a foolish answer, the same answer, a repetition answer, which leads you nowhere except back into yourself deeper. <coughs> the brave man, the courageous woman, will understand the lesson that I'm trying to get over to you, which is that you must bypass 
forget, ignore, pay no attention to, don't let it nag you, the computer. Your own mind, the way it has been conditioned, the way it's been, the way you've gathered all this so-called information and knowledge, which is useless, you have been given plenty of methods for bypassing your mind, which will scare you when you start to do it, because you don't know what else to do. You don't have to know what else to do on the spiritual path. What you have to, what you have to do is know that you cannot continue to do the same things and get, get a different result. Remember the rule, and I want to tell you that this is much more profound than you think. You can't have two things. You can have one thing, one or the other. You can't have your clinging to your computer mind and have inner freedom. Make up your mind what you want. And if you make up your mind that you're going to walk past the computer, computer, which you do by understanding the whole process, when you walk, walk by it, <clears throat> the minute you get by it, you will hear something that is higher than the computer which will solve your problem. And do you know what it is? This higher wisdom will say, there was no problem at all except that you insisted on consulting the noisy computer. Because you consulted it, you, you got you as the answer. You have the problem and you consult you and you get you as the answer. Round and round in a circle, useless, pointless, foolish. I know, I know. <coughs> I know how difficult it is because I know what question you're asking. Uh, and I know that it's your mind itself that is asking. Your mind is asking, but what is this other higher counsel light like? Always a wrong question. You'll never be able to answer the question, answer the question as long as you're asking it. And I'll tell you again, walk past the computer, the answer will come down and you'll see for yourself so clearly what I'm talking about. You'll see so clearly that the most foolish thing you ever did in your life is to think that your salvation and your safety resided in talking to yourself. And speaking of talking to yourself and to other people, have you ever heard the phrase, look who's talking? Look who's talking. Huh? You, it's younger, you used to hear that a lot, didn't you? Look who's talking. I'll make a little slight change in it. Look what's talking. There you go. There's your, there's your technique, your procedure. You are always asking how to do it, as if you haven't been given 20 hows already. Look what's talking. Look what's chattering inside of you. Look what is giving you advice. And have you ever noticed when you give yourself any kind of advice, that about three seconds later, you've forgotten it. Hmm? You're so excited that this is going to lead you to the upward path, and then you say, forget it, all right. Look what is talking. I'll guarantee you absolutely it is not a who. You think it is, because you've identified with all this foolish advice that you've given yourself, and you say, it's coming from me, therefore it must be pretty good stuff. I want to tell you that there's no who, there's no me, there's no I there at all. Oh, but oh, that computer. It, it has been programmed by evil. And that programming consists of taking advantage of your inability, for example, to pay attention to the right thing. When you begin to walk past it for the first few times, it will sense you walking past it. Your own tricky mind will sense you beginning to ignore it, beginning to bypass it. And I'll tell you what will happen. With all its fury, it will start the wheels churning. You know, the little wheels you see on outside on a computer go back and forth, back and forth. The lights will flash a dozen different colors. The clicking will increase to a pounding. And it grabs your attention and... How, how tragic. You're getting ready to pass by the computer to go out into you don't know what. 
But you're saying, I'm going to give something up without knowing what's going to replace it. I'm going to give up this computer. So you start to walk past it, and when you just get ready to clear it all together, it starts in with this mad attack. And you understand what that is? That is the habit system in your mind and in your feelings and your whole life that is living its life through you. You are indeed possessed. And since it has nothing to live through except you for now, it will make all these strange sights and sounds in order to grab your attention and it succeeds, doesn't it? Here, maybe you determine one day to apply spiritual lessons with a particular force, application, implementation. And you're walking around the house or wherever you might be, and you, you're doing pretty good for a little bit. That is, you're, maybe you're driving the car and you're aware that your hands are clutched on the wheel and you know where you are. At that minute, which, which you're trying to work to go beyond the commuter, to go beyond your mind and simply know where you are, the attack will come in. And see, here's your problem. You pay attention to it. Now, you can search through the law books of the land and you won't find any law that says you must obey the scream of the mad computer which senses its impending loss and screams to you in order to get you back to pay attention to it. One of the greatest sins, to use that word, in spiritual studies is the misuse of your power of attention. Have you noticed how your mind can shift back and forth in the space of five minutes to a dozen different things? And a lot of them are necessary. Physical attention is necessary if you're walking in a crowd. You have to watch you don't bump into people and things like that. Can you see how your atten attention is stolen by the computer mad mind, the computer in mad mind, which wants you to pay attention to it? And that is the last thing on earth that you should pay attention to. People, pe pe most people are worship, this is, this is a right word, people worship the computer. They worship your own mind. You do worship what you constantly pay attention to, do you not? That's what worship is, to attention, isn't it not? People actually worship that because slaves always feel comfortable with the, with the tyrannical man over them with a whip. When you start to walk past a computer, you're going to shake. Oh, you're going to be afraid. And I'll tell you what to do in that case. Just keep walking. One rule in this class is that you're permitted to shake all you want. Don't you try to be brave. You don't have any bravery. You have no idea what it is. You're attributing bravery to the computer, and the computer is always a coward. It doesn't want anything above its mechanical self. So when you start to walk past the computer, you're going to shake. And the farther you, listen, the farther you go, the less, you know, providing you keep walking now, and don't pay attention to its screams, they'll gradually, 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 slowly, slowly fade out. Uh, I'll pull a figure out of the air just to keep the illustration going. Say, say when you've gone 20 steps past the computer, which is screaming for your attention and trying to get you to come back and pay attention to it. After 20 steps, there will, there will be a certain new experience consciousness in your mind. And here, here is what it is, which is not easy to describe in words. In fact, it's impossible. But you will know it from yourself, and you'll know what I am thinking right now. After 20 steps away from the computer, there will be a dawning of a new awareness of a number of things that all come in at once, which does not come from your mind, not from, from your computer mind, because you've abandoned it, you've bypassed it, you've gone by it. And among this new awareness that will come to you is a sensing that one, that it was the right thing to do. Two, 
that this is a new kind of power that you have never known before. Three, that this power of understanding is different in coming from a, a different place. It's not coming from back there. You've left that. And now the message, instead of coming from the noisy com computer, which is gradually fading out of your mind, it's coming from up here. And you know that. And, and you understand what up here means. That's a figure of speech, isn't it? Something higher, but that's all right. You understand that it's coming down and going, <laughs> going into your mind and beginning to take the place of the computer that you can only have one thing, you can only be dominated, to use that word in the right way, you can only be dominated by one thing, you can be dominated by your very, very confused and noisy mechanical mind, or you can be dominated, beautifully dominated, by the light, by the, the true voice that's coming down, which is be, you have begun to make room for because you've bypassed the computer. The, the farther you walk, the more firm your step becomes, the doubts begin to fade out. And I'll tell you, finally, finally, you know through yourself, not from yourself, but through yourself, that you have contacted the God of this universe. Ah. See, most people, they, they talk about miracles. They don't know what it is. They call a miracle because they made a lot of money. They got a new friend. That, that's their idea of a miracle. It's no miracle at all. It is folly. It is trash. Do you want a real miracle that, that you know from yourself because it's utterly unlike anything you ever found in the computer life before? It will come down. You will feel it. It will go increasingly strong as you walk along. Now, now, you are no longer living your own own old mechanical computer life. And you understand perfectly the phrase that says that something else is living your life for you. You understand it before you feared that for something else to live your life for you because you were an egotist and you only wanted your no one's going to tell me how to live my life, that sort of thing. Ah, you persisted and you understand. The only thing worthwhile in this life is to get to the point where truth, reality, is living your life for you. understand it at last. Thank God I've got the computer system out of my life. But you have to go through that. You have to walk past it time and time and time again. It will call you back with its noise, fearing to lose you. It will call you back. You'll go back 10,000 times, 20,000 times. All right. Listen to what you're learning here this morning and start out again to bypass the computer. Walk right by it. You'll come back, walk, go again, come back, walk. Someday you'll find yourself three steps beyond it. The next day, ten steps. The next day, twenty steps. Now all is different. What a life.